as I said, the important thing here is we have to start challenging the history that was fed to us because it's not entirely true. To say that the history of Jamaica that I was taught at Casey or the history that I learned at university in New York is inconsistent is an understatement. Entire chunks, thousands of years of history have been omitted from what we were taught. We're not going to go that deep today. The idea today is to fill in some of the blanks and show you how it all connects to the circumstances that we find ourselves in on this island right now. Because we think that history is a dead thing, but it's not. It's the history that sets up the present and the future. All right? This first slide, I'm being kind of tongue in cheek about it. Just to make you wonder, what makes you Jamaican? And what makes this island Jamaica? You ever wondered about that? Who told you you were Jamaican? We know it wasn't God. And if God never tell you, then it can't be true. <laughs> it must be that some men made it up. Anyway, history is a weapon. And much of the history that we were fed in school is a fiction. But it was told to us in order to make us accept that England has a legitimate claim to own the island, fair and square. And that we are merely immigrants here, so we can't really challenge their ownership, can we? And second, that history is intended to make us believe that the government we have is legitimate. And that we are responsible for the debts that our government incurs. We're going to see how that's not entirely so. Now, in order to do that, we're going to have to take down some of these lies, which means that we're going to have to correct 500 years of history from 1494 to 2014, and 520 years. Seven points we're going to cover. The first point, Christopher Columbus was not an explorer. There were no such people as Arawak Indians, certainly not here. There was no transatlantic slave trade. I know that one sounds kind of shocking. There was no slave trade. There's no such island as Jamaica. <laughs> we were never given independence in 1962. We are not Jamaicans. Of course, if there's no island such as Jamaica, then there can't be people called Jamaicans, all right? And finally, the government is not ours, which explains a lot, doesn't it? They're not really working for us. All right, so first, lie. No such people as Arawak Indians. We're told that Christopher Columbus encountered a race of people he called Arawaks. But Spanish historians describe these Arawaks as docile, medium build copper-colored people, like the ones you see on the coat of arms, with straight black hair. And they said that they lived here for up to 10,000 years uh, ago. Problem is, no evidence of these people has ever been found. Understand that there is no Jamaican archaeology. There is nobody out there digging up any part of this island to try to find any evidence of anything. So they found no burial grounds, no tombs, no temples, not even a bone fragment or hair follicle so we can test some DNA. None of this, even though they say that these people lived here for 10,000 years. How do you live anywhere for 10,000 years and not leave an archeological record of yourself? That's because those Arawak Indians never existed here. In fact, the only people that we can prove existed here in this region are the so-called Caribs. And guess what? The Caribs are not medium-billed, copper-colored people. They are black. If anyone's ever been to Trinidad, or St. Vincent, or St. Lucia, or St. Kitts, where these Caribs supposedly were, you'll see that the people that call themselves Caribs are black. They do have some of them curly hair, straight hair, but we know that that exists inside the black gene pool anyway. All right? 
There were no Arawak Indians in this entire region. Research by pioneering black historians and anthropologists revealed that the people Columbus actually encountered here in 1494 were likely the same as he encountered in America, which he wrote about in his journals. They were black-skinned, nappy-haired Nubians. Okay? There's another explorer named Giovanna, Giovanni de Verrazano who came to America about 20 years after Columbus, 1514, and he wrote in his journals that the people he encountered were Ethiopian. He said nothing about copper-colored people. And if those people had existed in the Americas for thousands of years, it's a fair expectation that they lived on these islands as well. They lived everywhere. And we're going to see that they left evidence everywhere. So, the point I'm making is, most of our ancestors were already here. All right? And they had been here for tens of thousands of years, as I'm going to prove. Historians have discovered what they were called. They were called the Amaru. Amaru, uh, that is where, this is where the term America comes from. It doesn't come from Amerigo Vespucci. It came from the Amaru because they knew who was here originally. And another name for them is the Olmec Sheep. Well, guess what? Mec, Xi, Co, Mexico. That's where the term Mexico comes from. So if you talk about Americans or Mexicans, you're talking about our ancestors. And they inhabited the entire region, as I showed you, North, Central, and South America, and the Caribbean. They are the real Amerindians that I was taught in high school, and they were black people. You don't know them because Europeans gave them other names. Just like they made up the name Arawak from the Arawak, they made up all these other names to keep you from realizing that everything in the Americas is you. Every artifact they find is you. Every monument they find, you built. But instead they tell you it's Maya and Inca, and Aztec, and Toltec, and Taino, and Carib, and Arawak. These are all names they made up. Understand that. All right. And of course, they told you that this is what the Arawak looked like. Yeah. Or the Amerindians, right? Anyone ever seen any Jamaicans looking like this? <laughs> you know why? They never existed here. They want you to think that that's what the Arawak looked like because they don't want you to know that this is what they looked like. These are the original Amaru Khans. These are the original Olmec sheep. These are our ancestors. These are called the Olmec Colossi. Colossi from Colossal. And these are massive stone carvings of white people. <laughs> I mean, this guy looks pretty white, right? This is, this is a white dude, right? Yeah. No? No. Okay, well, okay. These are black people. And they're carved out of one solid piece of basalt rock. Basalt is the second hardest rock on earth. First hardest is granite, which is what the pyramids are made out of. And they've dated these at these heads, and they estimate that they're somewhere between 16,000 to 20,000 years old. Stop and think about that, beloved. 20,000 years ago, a race of black people excavated massive granite rocks out of the mountains, sorry, basalt rocks, and then etched themselves into these rocks. What kind of technology would they have had to be able to do this 20,000 years ago? Because it wouldn't have been a copper chisel. All right? And I like this slide. Just a comparison. Here's a white dude, and here's a white dude. <laughs> right? So we were certain that the Olmec were white. Okay. <laughs> these depictions weren't just depictions of ourselves. Because if you think about it, I'm not sure why it would be necessary to carve yourself into stone like that. These were actually depictions of our gods. 
But that's a powerful statement, isn't it? That the depictions of the gods look just like the people. You see what I'm saying? Okay? Historically, every ancient culture always depicted their gods to look like themselves. There's a reason it says in the book that the Creator created man in His image. That means your God must have looked like you. And since there's five billion black people on the planet, I would like to believe that a black God created me. I'm just saying. So those are the Olmec Colossi, and as I said, they're depictions of the black gods. And the people were the builders of civilizations. They were not primitive. Primitive people couldn't do that. And like our Kemetic ancestors from Egypt, our only ancestors engineered entire city complexes. Thousands of years before Europeans crawled out of their caves. Historians have nicknamed the Olmec the Mound Builders. Uh, they call them Mound Builders because they built these megalithic structures all over the Americas. This is the Pyramid of the Moon. It is in a place called Teotihuacan in Mexico. This pyramid is the second largest, well, it was the second largest pyramid by volume on the planet. It's now the third largest. And I don't know if you can get an appreciation of the scale of this, but I like this picture because you see these tiny dots, that's people. Just to show you how massive this thing is. And unlike the pyramids of Egypt, the pyramids built by the Olmecs were meant for you to mount. They were meant for you to climb them and go up there and behold the greatness of your ancestors. This was built by black people. The same stone heads I just showed you White archaeologists have confirmed that they were also the builders of these pyramids. This pyramid is 20,000 years old. And it is built from granite. And it is still standing unlike the World Trade Center. <laughs> this used to be the biggest pyramid on the planet by volume. It's called the Pyramid of the Sun. It's on the same complex. This was built by black people. It is massive. It's called the Pyramid of the Sun because it is designed to align with solar phenomena. This is the new king of the hill. Remember I said to you, this one was the biggest pyramid on the planet. That was until six years ago when they stumbled onto this. This is called El Mirador. It is in Mexico. Mirador is a Spanish word for veranda or rooftop because they discovered that when you stand on the top of this, you can see for miles. And guess what? When they stood on the top of it, now this had been covered up by jungle. Just to show you, imagine how old this is. This is real. This is not from a, a movie. This is not special effects. This is an actual photograph. All right? This pyramid is massive. You can't even see the base of it. It is so old that trees were growing up from inside it. This is in Guatemala, Central America. And this whole area was covered up by jungle for thousands of years. They don't even know exactly how old this is. But so far they've, dated it, they've estimated it's 26,000 years. There are potentially thousands of massive pyramids in that one city complex alone built 26,000 years ago, at least, built by the Olmec sheep, black people. So that's the first lie about Arawaks. The second lie, Cristobal Colon was a mercenary. This is the man that you know as Christopher Columbus. Anybody ever wondered why suddenly in 1492, all these Europeans decided that they were gonna jump on boats and start exploring everywhere? <laughs> well, there's a reason. There's always smoke, what, fire behind the smoke. In 1491, one year before his first voyage, there was a war between the Moors and the white Europeans. Actually, that war had been going on for a very long time. The Moors had ruled Western Europe for 700 years. But in 1491, when Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand defeated them at Granada in Spain, Pope Innocente, I love how the popes always have nice names, 
Pope Innocent. Pope Innocent the A legalized the enslavement of black people all over the world and the theft of their lands and their wealth by white Europeans. This happened in 1491 and then in 1492 the voyages all started, right? You had Portugal, Spain, the Dutch, France and Britain. Everybody just started exploring the so-called New World. How can it be the New World, by the way, if it's older than your world? I mean, I just showed you a 26,000 year old pyramid in the New World. Anyway, Columbus's first voyage was a military reconnaissance mission. Everybody understand what that is? When you want to wage a war with an enemy that you're not familiar with, you send somebody to scope them out. See how fortified their, their nations are, see what kind of weaponry they have. And we know this for a fact because he only took three ships. Everybody knows the name of those three ships, right? Nina, Pinta, Santa Maria. And he only took about 80 crewmen. But when he came back in 1502, no, it's already 1496, 17 warships and 1,300 soldiers. And those ships were carrying cannons, those ships were carrying armory, but he was just an explorer. Columbus and his crew sailed from island to island, wiping out the natives who fought back and enslaving the survivors. This mass murder was justified as converting savages to Christianity in order to bring them under the dominion of Rome. It's called forced denationalization. Denationalization is when somebody takes away your indigenous rights. And dispossession is when someone takes away your birthright property. That was what this whole voyage was about. Because that was the only way they could claim the land. They had to wipe out and disinherit the rightful owners. That is why they made up the story of Arawak. They don't want to admit that they came here, saw black people, and tried to eradicate all of them and then enslave the rest of them. And that their ownership of our island was illegal from day one. This was all done, as I said, with the blessing of the Pope and the Roman Empire, which owned the Kingdom of Spain, Kingdom of Britain, the Kingdom of France. And uh, everything the Romans did, they carried around a Red Cross. We know the Red Cross, we're familiar with it, right? Uh, the first time we saw those Red Crosses was on these guys. These are the Knights Templar. Yeah. Uh, the Templar were the armies that were sent into Africa to conquer and destroy. We also know the Red Cross from these three ships come sailing in from Cristobal Colon. This is the Santa Maria, the Nina, and the Pinta. See? Same Red Cross. Pay attention to that Red Cross. All crosses lead to Rome. There's a reason that our ancestors made up that word crosses. You know? What does crosses mean in our, in our language? You see? They knew that anytime some bad shit happened, crosses was behind it. Alright? But here's another place that you'll find that red cross that you probably never thought about. Look at this. What's that? What's this? This is a red cross. <laughs> Right here, that's the cross of the Templars. This is a seal of ownership. And you know how we know it's the cross of the Templars? Because what's this? That's Knight's armor on our coat of arms. All right. And then of course we have the fake arrowheads, the medium brown, docile, long-haired people. And out of many one people. You guys know that the last census, which was done in 2011, confirmed that this island's population is 98% Indians. Out of which many? Which many people? There's only one people on this island. But here you are, the Red Cross. Crosses, that's who owns the island. And of course, all crosses lead to Rome and this pedophile. This is the last Pope, Pope Benedict. I call him Pope Maledict because this is. I'm going to keep the language clean because we're recording. And again, by the way, let me just say, I mean, I know that the Christians in the room know that your religion and this man are not the same thing, okay? All right. 
All crosses lead to Rome. All right, point number three. <laughs> was it a slave trade or was it a transatlantic war? The story of a massive 300 year slave trading operation that brought 12 million Africans to the Americas, that's North, Central, and South, is a cover story for the European crusade against our black ancestral civilizations. As I just said, the Pope authorized it in 1491 and suddenly they were out there discovering places full of people. Places that weren't lost were being found. The slave trade was part of a centuries-long race war. Now this is powerful stuff. This is powerful stuff. Uh, and we're gonna, let, me, let me not get ahead of myself. In this war, Arabs, pale Arabs, who had been in conflict with the black Islamic empires of Africa since 1189, allied themselves with the white Europeans and black Christian converts in 1491 to wage a war that would destroy every black civilization on the planet. Again, a lot of stuff I'm going to touch on. I'm not going to go too deep in it because it's just outside of the scope of this. This transatlantic war combined military invasion and genocide with biological, psychological, social, legal, and financial tactics to achieve total domination over indigenous Nubian peoples. The defeat of the Nubians, sorry, the defeated Nubians were captured as prisoners of war. Again, we go back to the Europeans and their wordplay. The people you are calling slaves are prisoners of war. They're prisoners of war. And what you're calling a slave trade was a war. It was a race war. This strategy was done in order to dismantle families, tribes, and nations. You break them up, that's divide and conquer, to destroy languages, cultures, and lineages, and to dictate a new name, a new identity, and a new story for our people. In other words, to replace our greatness with weakness, to tell us that we didn't accomplish or build anything. We started out as slaves. So how were we made slaves? It was a process, it was a strategy. First, armed mercenaries invade your island and overpower your warriors. Check. Then they establish seaports like Port Antonio and Port Royal and Old Harbor and Kingston and Port Moran and Runaway Bay. These are ports from which to coordinate their massacre of the native populations. Step three, you then enslave the surviving population. Obviously, if you show up here and you, let's say he wiped out a million Nubians on Jamaica in 1494, what do you think the other million are going to do? I mean, that's what you call literally putting the fear of God into people. So we walked into slavery, some of us. Some of us fought back and we know who those people were. Step four, you then prevent them from teaching one another. We take so many things for granted, but understand that 150 years ago, it was illegal for black people on Jamaica to learn to read and write. It was against the law to teach a Negro to read or write. Do not take it for granted, beloveds. Use your intelligence. And step five, you impose a foreign religion that teaches the natives that they are savages and their invaders are servants of God. Now, I just want to say ahead of time, I'm not attacking anybody's religion. Because frankly, from my perspective, the blackness comes first. I really don't care what you call yourself. I call myself Buddhist. I don't care what you call yourself. You can pick any religion. But the blackness comes first. All right? So when I talk about Christianity, I'm talking about Christianity in the context of history. I'm not attacking a religion. I'm not attacking Christians. But religion is a weapon of conquest. 
Religion is a weapon of conquest. As I said, it is not possible for 10% to enslave the 90% without messing with them psychologically. It's just not possible. Alright? So this is where Christianity came in. Christian doctrine was used. Notice I said it was used. I didn't say that it taught this. But it was used to teach them that God, Jesus, looked like their slave masters. We all know the picture of white Jesus. Right? This was necessary in order to convince us that our enslavement was the will of God. It had to be. Because they came with the power of God. They had weapons that we hadn't seen before. They wiped out millions of us. They put the fear of God inside us and then they put up an image of God. And we feared that image. Because every time we saw him, we saw him, the slave master. Every time. Every time. That's why we were obedient. And it wasn't just that. But I want to show you that this is what makes this possible. You see that? This is from an island in the Pacific called Tuvalu. It's one of the last colonies that Britain conquered in 1968. Ain't that some shit? Right after we got independence, they were still going out there conquering more black people. They gave these people independence in November 1978, the year and month I was born. But of course, you know their independence doesn't mean anything because this was taken in 2012. Do these guys look independent to you? Do they look like they want to be carrying around this white dude as their king? And make no mistake, you know, we do the same thing on this island. We just don't put him up on the pedestal. And finally, the Bible, conveniently, is full of scriptures that made you accept all of this domination. And I want to begin by reading to you one particularly pernicious section of scripture. Now again, let me just make it clear. This is not the word of God. This is not the word of God. This is the word of men written into the book that you are told is the word of God. You follow me? God didn't say this. God didn't sanction any of this. God couldn't possibly have done that because God had to have been black. But I want you to read this because you need to understand the psychology. First Peter chapter 2 verse 18 to 20. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. What? What? For it is commendable if someone bears up, that means endures, bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. It is commendable for you to endure enslavement because you honor God when you do so. All right? Now this part I love. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? In other words, if you disobey your master and you get beaten, it's not commendable. There's no honor in that. Don't disobey your master. Don't try to free yourself. Don't run away. Don't set some slaves free. It's not commendable. But if you suffer for doing good, meaning doing what the master tells you, and you endure it, this is commendable before God. This is the depth of the psychological programming that was done to our ancestors right here on this island. This is not the word of the Creator. This was put into the book to ensure that an agenda was followed. So, have you ever wondered how these churches got started on this island? Starting in the mid-1700s, 
the plantation masters opened up the religion to the slaves. But they did it a very specific way. First of all, they made sure that one slave was taught how to read and write. This would have been the only literate black man in the room. And he would have been a house slave. But here's where this gets deep. The white master is sitting in the midst of the congregation. He's overlooking his slaves. But he's there to make sure that this guy teaches them what he's supposed to teach them. Right? This guy was called the overseer. Anybody here goes to a church of God? Pentecostal church? This is where your overseer came from. The overseers are not black, but this is where they came from. Again, this is not to attack your religion, it's just to show you that religion was used as a weapon, just like the bullets and the bombs, in order to conquer us. Now this one is going to be shocking. You are bonded property. A slave is bonded or bounded same word, same root. Bonded, bounded, binded. Same root, same word. The Spanish has succeeded in stripping the island of all this gold. We know that because we know that Columbus, after six years in this region, went back to Spain with so much gold that the price of gold collapsed in Europe and suddenly gold was worthless. So the British couldn't rely on gold. The Spanish took all of that. This island had two things that were more valuable than the gold. This island had agriculture, and it had black people. And so the British figured out a system in which they could use both of those resources to their advantage. This is the beginning of what you know as stocks and bonds. What was the stock? Your ancestors. Livestock, cattle, chattel. You've heard the term chattel slavery, chattel is property. This is where it comes from. It literally comes from cattle, from livestock. That's why they used to literally brand the slaves with a hot iron, just like they did their cows. So that was a stock. The bond was the certificate of ownership. So I, Ramian Reynolds, would be a stock. And the piece of paper that says that Mr. Reynolds owns me would be my bond. All right? And that bond carried a value. A field slave, or I should say a warrior slave, was worth more than a field slave, was worth more than a house slave, was worth more than a female slave, and so on. So the bonds varied in value, all right? The buying, selling, and trading of these bonds is what became known as the stock exchange. Like New York Stock Exchange like London Stock Exchange, which by the way was founded in 1678. So we know it was right there in the slavery mix. <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you all what a modern bond looks like. <laughs> Who knows what this is? This pretty decoration around the side, that's what makes it legal bonded paper. It's a certificate. It says right up here. It's a certificate. It's a bond. It's a bond. This is a bond. Remember I said, I'm the stock. This is my bond. And my bond carries a value. Depending on the stock. Depending on the quality of my stock. This is what is the basis of the stock exchange. This is what built the economy of England. Now let's zoom in on this because I want to show you some details on this. I can't just drop this bomb and move on. <laughs> this is a bond number. It's called a sequence number. It's a financial number that starts with A for asset. This seal is a seal of the corporation. 
that register you. We can spend a whole lecture on this. Here we have the certifying officer, the signature is important, is what certifies it, and then it's sealed. And we all know the Red Cross, the Cross of Rome. It's right there on your bond certificate. Rome owns you. This is not the play play thing. It's not theoretical. This is how the global financial system was actually built. And it's how it still functions. It is how white Europeans continue to extract wealth from black people. Point number six, moving through these, the so-called independence at last. <laughs> okay, in 1692, when colonial government was pretty much set up, right? Remember, they took it over in 1655, they named it Jamaica in 1661, by 1692, they had this lockdown. That government consisted of a governor, an executive council, and magistrate courts of admiralty. All the courts in Jamaica, up until 1962, were officially maritime courts. That means they were courts of commerce. They had nothing to do with law or common law. The governor was known as the lord of the land, and the chief commander of the Jamaica militia which up until 1952, that's the name of the JDF, it was called the Jamaica Militia. Has the Jamaican Militia, or let's say the Jamaican Army, has the Jamaican Army ever fought a war with another country? No. You know who the Jamaican Army has fought with? Us. Us. The only people these soldiers have ever killed is Jamaicans. Just like they did in Tivoli. We might have to edit that off the video here. But I'm just letting you all know, that is what they were there for. The Jamaican army is not there to defend us. Who are they going to defend us from? Trinidad? <laughs> we know they can't fight America, and that won't happen anyway. They are there to maintain the power of the Governor General by violence and force. By 1962, as the black population became a super majority, and I love that word, because what it means is that we went from being, from outnumbering them, to outnumbering them so massively that they knew that they couldn't possibly continue with the system that they had. They had to make some changes. And in order to appease the black citizens, the British Crown decided to hand over some responsibility to a desegregated local parliament. Remember, before 1962, the parliament was pretty much white. White people around this island are right. They always have. 1962, they allowed some negas to enter into Gordon House. Or I should say some more. I mean, you, Cheryl, was there, but he was like a token Negro. Not to offend anyone, all right? But this is all Independence did. The British flag, which has flown over Jamaica for the past three centuries, is about to be replaced by the Jamaica national flag, heralding the birth of the new nation. The Union Jack is lowered, and the new flag of Jamaica waves. It must have been a really powerful moment for everybody that was there, you know? 
I know my grandparents were full of pride, but we didn't know what they were selling us. All they did was literally give us a flag and an anthem. And I promise you that's all that changed. It was a lie. Here's what the Act of Independence did not do. And by the way, I've read that Act. I read a bunch of Acts. You have to when you're dealing with this subject matter. You've got to read a whole lot of colonial laws. We know what it did. Here's what it didn't do. It did not relinquish the Queen's claim of dominion over the island. She still owns it. It did not return ownership of the land and the resources of the people. We don't own them. It did not restore our birthright inheritance. It did not compensate the natives for the wealth stolen from us through 400 years of slavery. It did not remove the Queen of head of, as head of state. She's still very much there. And by the way, I've heard that the government here has said that they want to remove the Queen and move us to Republic. They don't have the authority. They do not have the authority. That's something that they tell you in an election to get you worked up because they know that Jamaicans are full of national pride. But they don't have the authority. They work for her. How your employees are going to take away your ownership? How can your employees take away your power? It did not rescind the Governor General as Lord of the Land. He still is. We know that. And he's still the Commander-in-Chief of the military. That's why, again, you might have to edit this, but that's why when they wanted, when Bruce Golding wanted them to go into Tivoli and kill some Jamaicans, he had to get the Governor General to declare a state of emergency and send in the army. The Prime Minister doesn't control the army. The army is still the militia and is there for the Governor General to enforce the power of the Queen through violence. I'm not saying this to be controversial. I'm saying this as a matter of fact. And more important, I'm saying this as a matter of law. It did not revoke the birth certificate bonds on the citizenry. We're still bonded. I showed you that. And it did not resolve the debts that have been accrued upon the people. This so-called independent nation started out flat broke. And not only were we broke, but we started out in debt. So the government of Jamaica and the Bank of Jamaica, which are both foreign-owned entities, meaning they're owned by the Queen. We don't own them. I've read the Bank of Jamaica Act of 1960. We do not own the Bank of Jamaica. All right? There is a reason that you can go to the University of the West Indies and never be required to read any of this stuff. There's a reason you can do four degrees I never learned that the birth certificate is a bond because if they taught you how your system of law was actually designed to work you probably would not submit to it. So the GOJ and the BOJ began to borrow large sums of money from predatory multinational lenders. We know them well. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank and the USAID. Those loans carried high interest rates harsh penalties called structural adjustment policies. Here's an example of a structural adjustment policy. We have three million people on this island. How many post-service general hospitals do we have? Six. Six hospitals on an island of three million people. Portmore is the most populous city in the Caribbean and Portmore still doesn't have a general hospital. The reason Portmore doesn't have a hospital is because of something called structural adjustment policies. When the IMF lends you money, they tell you what you can spend it on. And they told us explicitly, you can't build no new schools. We haven't built any new schools in 20 years. We haven't built any new hospitals in 30 years. This is why. This is the grip of poverty. The other thing that these structural adjustment policies have caused is a sell out of all our resources. That's why we don't own the bauxite. We don't own the tourism industry. We don't own the telecommunications company. We don't own the power company. We don't own the water company. We sold off all the farmland. We sold off the airports. We don't own them. So 52 years later, as we were waving flags this August, those SAPs are essentially running the economy. 
They dictate everything from the value of the dollar to the rate of income tax to whether a school stays open or your road gets fixed. Today, half of every dollar of tax you pay goes towards servicing the debt. And the other half, by the way, goes to royalties and the bondholders. Your taxes do not finance your country at all. At least your income tax doesn't. Not a dollar of it. The end result, of course, is a bankrupt economy. There is a group, a think tank in Washington, D.C. called the Center for Responsible Economic Policy. They published a report last year. In that report, they declared that Jamaica is the single most indebted nation on the planet. That means that of all the 198 countries on Earth, we're the only ones who owe so much money relative to the size of our economy. Our debt exceeds our GDP. We cannot possibly repay it. We're not meant to. And basically, we now have an entire population working to service that debt. We are now debt slaves. We have gone from being bound slaves to being bonded slaves to being debt slaves. That's why the subtitle on the flyer you got said how we were made slaves and why we're still not free. We're still free.